We have four major types of hereditary thrombophilias. All of them are autosomal dominant and all of them cause hypercoagulable state. Before the pathogenesis, we have to recall normal hemostasis. So, if damage to endothelial cell occurs, endothelium that was contained inside the endothelial cell will be released into the bloodstream and will cause transient vasoconstriction. After vasoconstriction, organism has to immediately cover and repair the damage area. In order to do this, endothelial cells release from weighable palladi bodies huge amount of von Willebrand factor. In the bloodstream, von Willebrand factor binds to subendothelial collagen under the disrupted endothelial cell. After that, platelets come to the site of injury and by the specific receptor GP1B, they bind to von Willebrand factor and exactly this simple step called platelets adhesion. After the adhesion, platelets become activated. In response to this, they undergo shape change that results in their degranulation. With degranulation, platelets release the content inside them, including the dense granules that contain ADP. ADP that is released into the blood acts on ADP receptor on platelets and activate it. Activation of ADP receptor forces platelets to transport gp 2 b 3 a receptor to the surface, where gp 2 b 3 a serves as binding site for fibrinogen. In addition to this, platelets from prostaglandins by COX enzyme begin to produce thromboxane A2, and the function of thromboxane A2 is to promote aggregation. When fibrinogen notices a gp 2 b 3 a receptor on platelet surface, Fibrinogen immediately binds to gp 2 b 3 a and when another platelet comes to the site of injury, platelet immediately binds by gp 2 b 3 a to fibrinogen, and this process is significantly accelerated by thromboxane A2. This binding occurs over and over again until platelet plaque will be formed, and exactly this gathering of platelets at the site of injury called aggregation, and aggregation results in formation of a platelet plaque. But platelet plaque is weak, and to stabilize it, to make it formidable, we have secondary hemostasis. The function of the secondary hemostasis is to make from weak platelet plaque a formidable structure that called thrombus, and the thing that makes this platelet plaque formidable is conversion of unstable fibrinogen into a stable fibrin. Secondary hemostasis is provided by coagulation factors that form coagulation cascade. The central factor of coagulation cascade is factor 10. The goal of both intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation pathways is to activate factor 10. Intrinsic pathway consists of factors from 12 to 8. Extrinsic pathway consists of just factor 7. Activation of factor 10 results in activation of factors 5, 2 and 1. Factor 2 called prothrombin that this activation becomes thrombin and factor 1 called fibrinogen that this activation becomes fibrin, and exactly fibrin makes from platelet plaque a formidable thrombus. So secondary hemostasis converts platelet plaque into a thrombus. To assess the extrinsic pathway, we use prothrombin time and international normalized ratio. For assessment of intrinsic pathway, we use partial thromboplastin time. We have to know that the activity of factor 10 and factor 2, so-called thrombin, is regulated by a specific molecule called antithrombin. Antithrombin regulates the activity of these two factors by inhibition. And another regulation is provided by protein C, that inhibits factor 5 and 8. And the specific feature of protein C is that it requires cofactor, which is protein S. So we can say that the function of protein S is to stimulate protein C. The first pathology called antithrombin deficiency. So if due to a mutation or due to antibodies production, the level of antithrombin decreases, then factor 10 and factor 2 becomes disinhibited. Their activity significantly increase and this causes increase in thrombus formation. Also important that antithrombin deficiency can be acquired because in patients with renal failure that have nephrotic syndrome, glomerular membrane become more permeable for proteins, so there is a possibility that antithrombin will be lost in the urine. Antithrombin deficiency has no direct effect on PTT, PT or INR. 
but important that in these patients heparin injection is not that effective. Recall that heparin acts by stimulation of antithrombin that cause increase in PTT. But with decreasing amount of antithrombin, there are no antithrombin molecules to stimulate, so PTT will only significantly increase or even will remain unchanged. The second pathology called factor V laden. The problem here is that due to a mutation, factor V is produced broken, and we know that this mutation causes substitution of guanine by adenine in the DNA molecule. As a result, in factor V protein at position 506, instead of arginine located glutamine, and this makes factor V resistant to degradation by activated protein C. To explain this, recall that the central dogma of molecular biology, DNA RNA protein. Basically, this dogma tells that the genetic information in DNA has to be copied to RNA molecule and carried to ribosomes where proteins produced. So initially we have a chromosome 1 and on this chromosome located gene that encodes the production of factor V. Gene is basically a part of DNA molecule, as we know DNA has coding and non-coding strands. And to use this information in the gene, information must be carried to ribosomes where proteins are made. So DNA molecule for this purpose makes a copy of the gene in form of prometrix RNA molecule. This process called transcription and transcription is provided by the DNA dependent RNA polymerase. And this results in production of prometrix RNA molecule. Let's suppose that our sequence of nucleotides located in a coding region that called exon. So this sequence of nucleotides will not be removed by RNA splicing and in form of matrix RNA molecule will be delivered to ribosomes. Ribosomes read nucleotide sequence in matrix RNA molecule in codons and include complementary to that codon amino acid, its arginine and glycine, and a particular amount of amino acids form protein. So in normal condition, in position 506, arginine is located. And exactly this factor V protein with arginine in 506 position can be regulated by protein C. Protein C provides degradation of activated factor V by cleavage exactly in arginine position. And by this cleavage, protein C inactivates factor V. But in pathological condition, point mutation in DNA molecule causes substitution of guanine by adenine. Now in coding strand will be thymine and in RNA molecule will be adenine. This results in formation of a CAA codon and complementary to that codon amino acid is glycine. So as a result of a mutation, factor V in 506 position instead of arginine now has glycine. And exactly this factor V called factor V laden. The problem with factor V laden is that with this substitution, protein C cannot recognize the cleavage site. So cleavage by protein C becomes impossible, thereby we can say that factor V laden is totally resistant to degradation by activated protein C. Massive increase in activated factor V in the circulation creates a prothrombotic state because eventually activated factor V will cause activation of factor 2 and 1 and this will cause massive formation of a thrombi. And usually this thrombi are formed in veins that eventually can cause deep venous thrombosis, cerebral vein thrombosis and also recurrent pregnancy loss. The next disorder is protein C or protein S deficiency. The problem here is that with decreasing protein C concentration, the ability to inactivate factor V and VIII decrease. So the amount of activated factor V and VIII increase, and this creates a potent procoagulative state, because eventually they will cause formation of a thrombi. So this greatly increases the risk of deep venous thrombosis, especially after intake of warfarin. Because, as we know, initially warfarin creates procoagulative state that can cause warfarin-induced skin necrosis. 
Also, we have the disorder called prothrombin G20210A mutation. The concept here is that the point mutation in three untranslated region in DNA molecule results in uncontrollable production of prothrombin molecules. And obviously, with increasing amount of prothrombin, formation of fibrin increase, and thereby more thrombi are formed. And this greatly increases the risk of venous thrombosis. If you like content, please press like and subscribe button. All the best!